Okay, now we're looking at consumer surplus and producer surplus all the way through. We're going to look at all the different graphs. Um, and this is the most heavily assessed part of, of this entire unit. So uh, we'll definitely spend some time with this. All right. So first, what is consumer surplus? Consumer surplus is the difference between the minimum, which every one of us has, the, or I'm sorry, the maximum price that each consumer is willing to pay, right? So it's the difference between that maximum price and then what you actually pay. And if we look at this graph right here, we see the demand curve representing what consumers, uh, what their interests are, that there's like some consumers way down here who are willing to pay a very high price, way up here. But they don't have to pay that price. They can pay P1. So as a result, that's consumer surplus. The difference between what I'm willing to pay and what I actually pay is consumer surplus, right? So if I'm willing to pay $100, they actually pay $50, then my consumer surplus is 50, the difference between those, right? It's represented graphically as below the demand curve and above the price. Reason being is this person over here, they're only willing to pay a price over here, right? Very, very low price. They're not gonna be able to have access to it because that's their maximum price and the, the price of the market is above that. So they're out of the market. That's why it's confined to this triangle right here. What's producer surplus? Producer surplus is the difference between the minimum a business is willing to sell a good for and the price that they actually get to sell it for, right? The revenue they actually produce, right? So same, same idea here. Let me get a different color just so we can differentiate. But let's say this producer down here, they're willing to sell it for a very low price. They've got great economies of scale. They can produce it really, really cheaply, right? But they don't have to sell it at this low price. They can sell it all the way up here at P1 difference between the minimum price they're willing to get, what they actually get is producer surplus, right? So if my minimum, if I'm willing to sell this good for a minimum of $50, that's my minimum. I, I'll sell more than that, but I'm not going to go below 50, right? But I get to sell it for $150. That's the market price. Well, I just made $100, right? My producer surplus is $100 because my minimum was 50, but the market price is 150. Right? So that difference is represented by the difference between this price and that price, right? creating this triangle here. And the general rule is producer surplus is above supply, below price. The reason being is if I come over here, there are some businesses that are only willing to supply this good at a really high price, but they're not going to be able to because nobody's going to buy it at that price. So they're out of the market, and that's why it stops at the market price. Okay, so those two triangles split right in the middle. It doesn't matter how big or small these triangles are. They happen to be the same size here, but they could be differing sizes. As long as there's no deadweight loss, then we have a fully efficient economy. So sometimes you'll see something where it says, hey, this economy is efficient. What's that mean about producer and consumer surplus? Well, that means that they're maximized. They're at the maximum amount that they can be for both parties. Excellent. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, and sometimes you'll have to calculate the area of this, which is just one half base times height. So your base will be from zero to Q1. Your height would be from zero to P1. And you do one half of that base times that height and you'll get there. All right. What happens when we put a price ceiling or price floor on? Well, of course, we're not going to have an efficient economy. We already know that. But let's look at it. It's going to kick us into disequilibrium, right? So I like to think of this as like a hatchet, right? We, uh, we put a price ceiling down here below our current price. As a result, our quantity supplied is very low. Sure, people demand more of it, but it doesn't matter. We have a closed economy here. We're not importing. It doesn't matter that people want it. The only ones that are going to be bought and sold are right here. So the market is cut off. The rest of this doesn't exist. All right? And now we simply implement our methodology here. We know that our consumer surplus is going to be below demand above my price. Right? So at my price ceiling, it's going to be right here. So my consumer surplus, hey, this graph is actually wrong. <laughs> Let's fix this graph. Uh, my consumer surplus is going to be this entire area here, right? Up and until that point. That's all going to be consumer surplus. And that should make some sense. Price ceiling is there to help consumers. So it's above price, below demand, that whole big box right there. How do we find producer surplus? Producer surplus is going to be the area above supply, below price, like we just talked about. And so it's going to be this little triangle right here. That's going to be my producer surplus. It's tiny. So what happens when we have a price ceiling? We see an increase in consumer surplus, which is what we're going for. 
but a decrease in producer surplus. And then what about all this area that used to be a part of our efficient market but isn't anymore? We call that area right there dead weight loss, DWL, dead weight loss. It used to be a part of the market, but it was cut off, right? Like if you cut off your finger, it used to be a part of your body, but it was cut off. It's not there anymore. It is dead, a dead weight loss. It used to be a part of the market, but isn't anymore. If that's the case, it's always, always, always dead weight loss. Okay, let's look at the price floor in a closed economy. Again, we have a disequilibrium, right? Price floor at P, P2, our quantity demanded is very low because it's a high price. Supplied is very high. It's all the way over here. That doesn't matter. This works like an ax. It cuts off the marketplace, right? Because even though people supply more, we're only going to buy and sell in the marketplace the ones that are demanded domestically, right? So it cuts it off just like that finger. And then we implement it. What's our effective price? It's P2. So how do we find consumer surplus? It's below demand above that price. So A represents consumer surplus. How do we find producer surplus? Producer surplus is above supply, below price. So it's C and B right there. Again, cut off all this other stuff, not a part of the market anymore. How do we find dead weight loss? D and E. They used to be a part of the market, but they aren't anymore. They're out of there. So when we have a price floor, it helps the producer. So producer surplus is going to go up. Red area is large. But consumer surplus is going to go down, and it's going to create dead weight loss. Okay. Hopefully that made some sense. Let's move on. Mm -hmm -hmm. World price and tariff. World price and tariff. First, now we're dealing with an open economy. So the world price rules, right? So even though our domestic price here would be somewhere up here, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the world price in the international market sets the price for our firms as well if we're competing in a global economy. So our world price is the new law. Now at our world price, we actually have a shortage, right? It's below. So our quantity supplied is very low domestically. Our quantity demanded is very high. But now we don't have a closed economy. We have a shortage. How do we meet everybody's needs? We import those goods. So you can see here the distance between those two quantities is our quantity that is imported. So sure, some of it's going to be domestically produced, which is over here, based on quantity supplied, but the rest of it is going to be imported. So now with that information, we find our consumer surplus and producer surplus. Same rules apply. Below demand, above price, but not above equilibrium price, above world price. <clears throat> so our consumer surplus is huge. Below demand, above price, this giant triangle. Why is it so big? It's so big because we aren't limited by what we can produce. This is a cutoff here like it would be if this was a price ceiling in a closed economy. Wide open, giant consumer surplus. But domestically, our producers, very few of them can compete with that world price. It's just too low. And so our producer surplus is very, very small. Now, it is possible for our world price to be above here to create a surplus, and we would export those surplus if it's above it, right, which we're saying right here. If a surplus we export, and then the producer surplus is very large, and consumer surplus is very very small. But most often, we, sh we demonstrate it with this curve right here. Okay, now, what can we do? What's the problem here? Well, the problem is we're losing American jobs, right? All of these imported goods are coming from other nations, and we are not uh, employing very many people in this marketplace. Look at how small producer surplus is. So what do you do? You implement a tariff. A tariff is simply increasing the price. That's all you do increase the price. So now I go from P world to P tariff, right? With that new price, we can calculate our consumer surplus below demand, above price. So it's this large triangle here. It's not as big as it used to be, right? Well, it's not this huge thing. It's a little smaller. What about our, our producer surplus? Well, producer surplus is above supply, below price. It's this smaller triangle right here, right? So producer surplus is grown, but not completely. But we're bringing back American jobs in that instance. But we now have this whole area here that used to be a part of producer or consumer surplus, as we can see up here, that isn't anymore. What do we do with that? Well, a portion of that is going to be our government revenue. Government revenue, our tariff, is the distance between these two, right? One's P world, one's P world plus tariff. So that's our height. And then we only tariff our imports, which are smaller now. With that increased price, we only have a shortage of Q2 to Q3. 
small, right? Quantity demand supply is still low, but it's higher than it was before. Quantity demand is still high, but it's smaller than it was before. But that is the the tariff is a per unit tax on those imports. So that's the amount or the quantity of that tariff. So it's going to be this box right in the middle, which is going to be our government revenue. Now we still have two triangles right here and on the other side that used to be a part of the market, but aren't anymore. What do we call those? That is dead weight loss. Okay, that's how you analyze world price and tariff. One final concept, and that's excise tax. Excise tax is a per unit tax that shifts the supply curve to the left. So let's look at this one down here. Supply curve shifts to the left. When it does that, it's the distance between those supply curves, which is our tax. That's that vertical distance right there, right? That vertical distance creates a government revenue box kind of right in the middle here. Again, we have kind of our X, right? Now we're only going to produce this quantity because our supply has shifted. Our equilibrium quantity is lower at higher price, right? So that axes off our, our thing. This whole area in the middle, as we can see here, is our tax revenue, right? The per unit tax distance between the supply curves times the quantity of the goods that we're producing is our per unit tax. So that's going to be government revenue. Above that, below demand, above our price that the consumer pays, which is going to be 650 in this case, right, is going to be consumer surplus. But the producer takes so much less than that because the government's taking a buck in the middle of this, right? So it's going to take home less than that. So it's above supply below the price that they are effectively getting. So this triangle down here is producer surplus. Now, of course, we have this little triangle over here, which used to be a part of the market, but isn't anymore. What's that called? That's dead weight loss, right? It's gone. Now, final thing is the tax burden falls on different people, right? producers own a portion of that, but consumers do too. And it's a distance between the effective price, so the price for the buyer, and the former price. So the price used to be PE, now it's PB, right? So that distance is what the, the buyer or the, the um, consumer loses, right? We call it loser or consumer loss or buyer loss. And then we have what the producer takes home, which is down here, P3, versus PE. That's the burden, the amount of tax that the producer takes home. Now, what we know is that if it's elastic, then the consumer carries the heavier burden, right? I'm sorry, that should be flipped. If it's elastic, then the uh, producer carries the heavier burden, right? And if it's inelastic, the consumer carries a heavier burden. Here's why. If it's elastic, it means if I change the price on these consumers, if I charge it to them, they're going to demand a whole lot less of my good. I know that. I'm going to lose a bunch of money. So as a result, I can't afford to raise the price on consumers, so I absorb the loss myself. If it's highly inelastic, it doesn't matter, right? They're going to buy it no matter what. So sure, there's this tax, but I just put it off on the consumers. They carry all of the burden, right? Because they're willing to buy it anyway. So whenever we put a gas tax on gasoline, for example, or we put a tax on cigarettes, they're highly inelastic. People are going to buy it no matter what. And so the burden goes directly to the consumers and the producers pay none of it because they don't have to, right? Because they know you're going to buy it even if the price is higher. Okay. Hopefully that's made some sense with excise tax. Check it out. Um, we'll, we'll go over this in class today as well. And uh, good luck on the test tomorrow. Peace.